So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're continuing on in Paul's letter, and we understand that he's addressing some, some issues that he's heard about. We understand that he's addressing some questions that have come from the church at Corinth. And for the last uh, seven, eight, nine, last three chapters, he's been addressing those questions. And tonight, he is going to take at least the first part of this, um, this chapter and discuss uh, Israel's example that they have left for us. Uh, the, the children of Israel, God's chosen people, if you know the story, when God t- called Abraham, Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, and chose uh, him, and, and he believed God, and God began his nation of people through Abraham and throughout history. They've been God's special people. And so what Paul reminds the Corinthians about and us about tonight is that we can learn from Israel. We can learn from the way that God provided for them. We can learn from their mistakes. And we also can learn that we're no different from them as far as people go. We're all people. And so tonight, I think there's three ways to break up. the. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13. And I think you can break that section up into three parts. Verses 1 through 5 is don't forget. Verses Uh, 6 through 11 is don't repeat. And verses 12 and 13 is don't be fooled. So don't forget, don't repeat, and don't be fooled. I think that's an easy way to break up these 13 verses. Where Paul's going to reach out to the believers in Corinth and give them some reminders. So let's look at this tonight. We'll, We'll read all 13 verses at once here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ." But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Let's uh, pray tonight. Now, Father, I ask that as we come to Your Holy Word, Lord, I know just personally that there's distractions and and, and things that are trying to take my mind and my heart away from this message tonight, and I ask You that You would please focus me in, and and, um, I yield my, my mind and my voice and my lips and my tongue to You, Lord, and that You may use it for Your, as Your messenger tonight, Lord, please. Lord, I ask that you would um, help me to say what you'd have me to say, and that only. And Father, I pray for all of us tonight as we do go through your holy word here that um, we would do just what it says here, and that is learn to remember 
um, to see the examples before us. And, Father, that we would be wise enough to avoid the things that many of the Israelites should have avoided and have the right mind and heart um, that they should have had much of the time in the wilderness there. Lord, as we consider the fact that we're all the same, we're all in the same flesh, we're all just people, I ask that you would help us um, not to be so prideful to think that we can't possibly stumble and fall. Um, Lord, we have a warning from your word tonight um, to take heed. And Lord, I ask that you would help each individual in this room, all of us, Lord, that we would walk closely with you and let your Holy Spirit and your Holy Word be our guide. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So what can we learn from Israel? Well, the first five verses here, the idea is to not forget. Don't forget Israel. Don't forget where they came from and how they got to where they are. Don't forget, it says. Look at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Don't forget our history. Don't forget uh, where God's people, so to speak, came from. Those who went before us, the forefathers as they are called, were guided by the cloud and were led through the sea on dry ground. Uh, The Israelites, as you know, were in Egypt because of the famine. God sent Joseph ahead to preserve them. The famine was uh, all over the world, and so they went to Egypt to be able to buy food to eat, and they wound up staying there. And As you know, they were there for 400 years, and and most of that time was not good for Israel. They're came a Pharaoh after the one that Joseph knew real well, and he didn't know Joseph nor the God's people, and so they were very hard on God's people. And because the Israelites grew so large, the Egyptians became afraid that they would overtake them in their own land, and so they put them into slavery. And it was hard on God's people for many, many years until, as you know, God sent Moses to deliver his people. And when God sent Moses to deliver the people... Uh, They made their way to the promised land, which shouldn't have taken very long. But because we are people and because we're stubborn and we don't like to listen and we like to go our own way and do things our own way, it uh, it wound up costing many of them a great deal. Most of them didn't get to go in to the promised land. But while they were wandering, while they left Egypt to go to the promised land, God was leading them. God was leading them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The Bible says that they were a protection unto God's people. And, of course, that very famous account of where God led His people through the Red Sea. And that is what verse 1 is all about. But uh, let's let's not just remember it tonight. Let's take a look at it. So we're going to be doing some flipping back and forth uh, between the New and the Old Testament. So keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians 10. And let's go back to Exodus 13. All the way back. To Exodus 13. And we'll see here exactly what Paul is reminding them of. The exact spots that Paul is reminding them of. Exodus chapter 13. And we're going to begin in verse 21 and read 21 and 22. Okay, Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them... Uh, by day and a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night and a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So God was personally involved in leading His people. He said, so don't forget that from the very beginning, God has led His people. And if we're not to forget that, it's to remind ourselves that God is still leading His people. We don't have a cloud and a fire today. We have the Holy Spirit within us and the Word of God. But God is not going to stop leading His people. And then you note there at the end of verse 1 it says, And all passed through the sea. 
Well, and just over in chapter 14 is where that takes place. In verse 22, 14, 22, it says, And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And so we remember that. Uh, God parted the sea, and they walked across on dry ground, and the waters were a wall on either side. And when they reached the other side, the waters came back and covered all of Pharaoh's army and wiped them out. And God preserved His people. And so we're to remember that from the very beginning, God has preserved His people. He's taken care of His people. When it looked like there was no other way, when it looked like there was no way out, God took care of His people. Don't forget, God will lead us and God will take care of us. And so now back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we come to verse 2, and we're not to forget that it says, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So when it talks about being baptized, it just means immersed. All were put under or all were immersed under Moses' leadership as he was led by God. So now flip back over to Exodus. I told you don't, don't lose your spot there. Uh, Exodus chapter 14 Verse 31, Exodus 14, 31 says, And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. You see, the people were immersed under the leadership of Moses. God has always had a, a leader for His people. And now we have God's leadership in the way of His Holy Spirit. God will lead and guide His people. He will protect His people. Don't forget that. We are baptized under the leadership of Jesus Christ. We're immersed into His leadership. We're immersed into Christ. All right, in verse 3, uh, chapter 10, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians, it says, And all did eat the same spiritual meat. You ready? Go back over to Exodus 16. Exodus chapter 16. Verses 14 and 15. They ate of that spiritual meat. Exodus 16, 14 and 15 says, And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. So God had provided the bread for them to eat. And we know that in John, uh, we, as we went through the book of John recently, we know that it, Jesus says, You thought that Moses gave you that bread in the wilderness. It was God that provided it for you. And Jesus says, I am that bread of life. And so as they had spiritual meat, God has given us spiritual meat as we partake of the Lord Jesus. Now, uh, manna, you know what they were saying, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. Manna literally means this, what is it? So guys, when your wife makes you a meal, don't say, sweetie, this is manna, okay? <laughs> you might mean it to sound good, but you're saying, what is it? You know, and so don't do either one of those. Everybody awake tonight? That was one of my better ones. I mean, I, if, if that won't get you laughing, we'll just play the music and I'll walk out, all right? All right, so they ate of that, that spiritual meat. Now, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, it says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ, capital R. Did you see that there? Now, if you go back to Exodus chapter 17, it says in Exodus 17, 6, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And so the rock there, another time they come, and uh, he says to speak to the rock for water, and Moses strikes the rock again, and that was a big no-no. In fact, that was the straw, if you will, that broke the camel. That's why Moses couldn't go into the, the promised land. So that was pretty harsh. Well, the rock was a type of Christ. That's why in 1 Corinthians 10, it's a capital R. And the rock would only be smitten once. Once and for all, Jesus died. 
And so when Moses hit the rock again, um, he was doing something completely out of line. He was just supposed to speak to it. But it was a type of Christ. And through a rock, God provided water. Say, so that just, what a weird way to provide life-giving uh, sustenance. Well, that's what many would say about Jesus Christ. What an odd way to save the world. It, it just doesn't make sense. It, it, it seems like there's something we should do. I mean, water from a rock? That just doesn't happen. Shouldn't we dig a well? No. I'm just going to provide it for you. And it's free. You can't do anything to get it. It's coming. And so as Paul is reminding us and them about the past, don't forget, he says, how God has provided. And then, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament, this time to Numbers 14. Go over to Numbers 14. And we'll see exactly what Paul is talking about. Numbers 14.23 says, Numbers 14, 23, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. So, only two got to go in from that first generation, and that was Joshua and Caleb, because they believed. And so Paul reminds them here, but God was not pleased with many of the Israelites. Why? Because they didn't believe. Because they didn't believe. And brothers and sisters, we will not get very far if we don't believe. If we don't just take God's word for it. And so, verses 1 through 5, don't forget. Don't forget, people. Don't forget God's people. That the example is before us. Israel, as our example, shows us uh, several things. That God guides God protects, and God provides. Don't forget that. You've seen it before in them, and He's still doing it today. And now in verses 6-11, through 11, He changes the tone, still speaking of Israel, but instead of don't forget, this time it's don't repeat. Now He's going to give them four things to avoid. Four things that Israel did that we are to avoid. Avoid examples for us to remember. So in uh, uh, chapter 10, verse 6, it says, Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So this is our example now. Do not lust after evil things. Because when we get those evil things, there are consequences that come with them. Remember, God's not out trying to ruin us. He's not out to try to stop our fun. God, on the other hand, uh, contrary-wise, is protecting us from things that will hurt us. And so that's why these are four things we're to avoid. So he says, let's think of these four things that Israel did and it cost them greatly. Verse 7, he says, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. All right, let's go back to Exodus 32 and see exactly what he's talking about. What's he talking about? Well, we can see it in Exodus 32. Don't be idolaters. Do not be idolaters. Don't have false gods. All right, Exodus 32, 1 through 6. Check it out. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount... The people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool 
after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. Here it is. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. That's the exact phrase that Paul reminds them of back in 1 Corinthians 10. And so they were idolaters. Remember when Moses was taking his good-natured time, time up in the mount with God and the people became impatient? God, where are you? Where is our leader? What have you done with him? Well, since God's not going to lead us any longer, we need to make up our own gods and we're going to provide for ourselves a God that will give us what either God cannot or will not. And that's what all a false God is. Something that will give us what we believe that God either will not or cannot. Now take that definition and look into our lives. And, and it's scary to think. how we value some things in our life as God's. God can't provide this, so I will go to... Or God won't provide this, so I will go to... You know what that is? It's a false God. He says, don't do that. If God... Let's start here. There's not anything God cannot provide. So it's not a matter of that God can't provide it. But you know, there's many things God won't give for our own good. And when He says, no, you're not to have that, there is a good reason for it, despite what we think. But when we say, okay, God, if you won't, I'll find something that will, we've made that a God. Paul says, don't do that. If you don't have it, God doesn't want you to have it. Don't go after it. If he says no, stay away from it. Don't find a way, just stay away from it. And so then back in 1 Corinthians 10, we come to verse 8. And he says, let us neither commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Now for this, we'll have to go back to Numbers 25. Check this out, Numbers 25. And by the way, if you've stopped flipping because you're like, okay, enough's enough, you're going to want to check this one out because there's a, an apparent contradiction here that we're going we're gonna to put to rest. <clears throat> this is where some people say, you see God's Word, it didn't add up there, something's wrong. No, nothing's wrong. Alright? Numbers 25 Verses 1 through 9. It says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the Lord began to commit whoredom, uh, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man uh, of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague or 20 and 4,000. Now, did you see the apparent contradiction? 
Verse 9 says, those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. What did it say in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 8? How many? 23,000. So what happened? Did God lose count? Did the Holy Spirit forget to tell Paul one more? No, that's not what happened. Look with me again. Who did Paul or who did uh, Moses tell him to hang? Look at verse four. And the Lord said unto Moses, "Take all the heads of the people, not their heads, their leaders. Take all the heads or the leaders of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun." Okay, so they slayed every one. So they took the leaders of the people and hanged them. And how did the rest of them die? Well, the rest of them died in a plague. Look at verse 8. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust them both through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. So people died two ways. The leaders died by hanging and the people died by a plague. How many people died by a plague? Verse 9. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. And so now... Allegedly, apparently, there were a thousand leaders. And so we can see 23, 23,000 people died plus the leaders. 24,000. Why did they die? What was the plague? Why did God send it? He sent a plague because the Israelites committed fornication by going with and entering into physical relationships and marriages with godless people, with people of false gods. And God forbade that all through their history. They were not to marry people that were ungodly. They were not to marry the people. They were not to take unto them wives of the land. And that's what God's people were doing. And they were beginning to worship those gods because of the marriages they made. And so we're not to give ourselves, we're not to intermingle, we're not to commit fornication, period. Or especially not to be unequally yoked. He says, don't do that. He reminded them of Israel's error. And then back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. You remember that account? Go back to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21, verses 4 through 6. Numbers 21, 4 through 6. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against... God, and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Why? Because they tempted Christ. They shook their fist at God, not just Moses, But at God, did you see that? And the people spake against God and against Moses. So what did they say against God? God, wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? They're accusing God of bringing them out to die. They tempted Christ. And Paul says, don't do that. Remember what happened when they tempted Christ. When they spake against God and Moses, telling God that what he had done for them was not enough. Don't do that, Paul says. And back in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, the fourth thing. He says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. He's talking about complaining. And uh, back in number 16, the whole chapter really is about a group of people getting together and complaining that Moses was the boss and they couldn't be the boss. Korah and his people. And they got together and complained about how Moses was the only one who got to be the boss. And what did God do to them? Well, in, in uh, Numbers 16, verses 31 and 32, look what it says. 
And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. God swallowed them up. Why? Because they were complaining that God didn't have it right. God didn't get it right. God didn't know what he was doing. God had no idea what he was doing there in the wilderness. And they had had enough, and they were ready to take over. And so Korah and the loudmouths that were with him, the Bible says the earth literally opened up. They all went down, and the earth closed back in on them. The earth swallowed them up. God said that was enough. It says in 1 Corinthians 10 that they were destroyed of the destroyer. Complaining was an issue that stuck with Israel for their history. And on the heels of all their complaints was some kind of destroyer. Don't complain, he said. Don't tell God he doesn't know what he's doing. And by all means, don't think that you can do a better job. Complaining about God's provisions. And what does he say in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10? Now, all these things happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. He says, listen, learn from everything that they've done. Learn how God has provided for them. and Learn the, the mistakes and the sins that they committed. Learn from it. And don't commit the same things. And the, one of the greatest bits of wisdom we can get in this life is to learn from others. Don't make every mistake for yourself. Yet we, we think that, you know, somehow we're going to turn out okay making the same mistakes other people did. And so we, we are to learn. We're to look back and say, God has been good. God has provided. He's given us everything we need. He, he's going to continue to lead us. He's, he is continuing to lead us. He's providing for us. So remember that. And remember, stay away from sin. Because there are grave consequences. Remember, Paul says. It's interesting that at this point in his letter, after addressing the issues, after addressing their questions, he kind of stops everything and says, look, it's already been done once. Our examples are from the Old Testament. Look at them. Learn from them. You don't believe me? Look what's happened in the past. And then finally in verses 12 through 13, he says, don't be fooled. You're no different than they are as far as being people, right? Look at verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Man, when you think you're incapable of falling, look out. Take heed. Uh, we've all seen a highly favored team enter a game against a no-name team. And you see that major upset, right? The major upset where the number 16 beats the number 1. Didn't it happen this year? Who was it? I can't remember. Anybody remember who it was? Virginia. It was Virginia. University of Virginia had a number 1 seed in the NCAA tournament, and they lost to a 16 seed, which has never happened in the history of the tournament. Now, I'm not saying that Virginia went into that game thinking we've got it all figured out and we don't have to play hard. Could be. But I think we've all been around the block enough to know that when you think you've got it all figured out and everything's cool, look out. Watch out. Just when you think you're in control, look out. Just when you think you've got everything as it ought to be, watch out. Be wise. Be prudent. Proverbs says, the foolish man sees the trouble and, or the wise man sees the trouble and hides himself. He sees the trouble coming down the road and he gets out of there. He doesn't go looking for it. Be smart. Take heed. Watch out. Just when you think you've got it all figured out and nothing bad can happen to you, that you're not going to stumble, watch out. 
I'll never forget when I was young. I, I think I've told my daughters this a million times, and I think I've told my Bible class a million times, and I may have told you, so bear with me. It's just a, a perfect example. When I was a young lad, uh, it had snowed a bunch over there in, in Price Hill, and, and I had a, a sled. Remember the blue sled with the, the plastic handles on it? And we were going to go sled riding at Rapid Run Park. And we get to Rapid Run Park, and there's a... Have I told it before? All right, this is a good one. And uh, there's a real good hill at Rapid Run Park. And at the bottom of that hill, though, there's a little man-made pond. Uh, it's like a reservoir, really. And uh, I pointed my sled to go down the hill, and I was going right toward that man-made pond. And my dad said, look, you don't want to do that because your momentum is going to take you into that pond. And I said, look, Dad, it's freezing out here. The pond is frozen over. I'll just slide right across it. And I can't believe it. He said, okay. I love it. Come on, Dad. I got this. I'll just glide right across the ice. Okay. So I go flying down the hill, and everything's awesome until I hit the ice. And when you know it, it's about as thick as a piece of paper. And I went straight down into the water. And it wasn't deep. I think it was maybe two feet deep. But I, I hit the water, and I stood up and turned around, and it made a loud noise. And all the kids on the hill, <laughs> I mean, everybody's laughing at me. My dad comes running down the hill or sliding down the hill and, and gets me out of there. And we went straight home and I got warmed up. And he never said, told you so. He should have, but he never did. He never rubbed it in. But man, I learned. I thought I knew what I was doing. What does dad know? I've got this. Oh, I'll take heed. Look out. Just when you think you know it all, you're going to go through the ice. So watch out. So Paul finishes with a very familiar verse for us. Verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Now first of all, that puts us all in the same category. You can say, oh, nobody's had it worse than me. No. All of our temptation is common to man. We're all tempted. We're all tempted. So there's no temptation that's taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So there's no temptation that's going to come to us that's not common to everybody else. You say, I have the weirdest temptation. Somebody else has it. I don't want to know, okay? But somebody else has it. That's what it says. Um, those great prophets... I have the same temptations that we do. For crying out loud, David, right? The man after God's own heart. He had temptations and gave in to them. Same stuff. All of us have the same temptations. It's common to man. And what also is common is that God is faithful. And God will, with a temptation, make a way to escape. There's a way out. Now let me tell you this, I've lived long enough to know that there's been temptations in my life when I saw the way to escape, and I still went the other way. When we go back to verse 12, watch out, watch out, remember. Remember, God gave Israel a way out. He sent 12 spies. Ten came back and said, there's no way we can do it. Two said, yeah, we can, and they wanted to kill those guys. There was the way. They wouldn't take it. And they suffered greatly for it. Temptation is common. God is faithful. The question is, Will we take the way of escape? Will we follow the Holy Spirit's prompting? Or will we follow our flesh? And Paul says, remember, when you follow God, you'll go through on dry ground. When you do it your way, you'll wander for 40 years. Remember. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the examples that are before us in your word. 
And Lord, you have been so kind to us to let us see the good and the bad. You've let us see the outcome of both types of yielding. And Lord, I ask you that we would be a people who would trust you enough to yield to your Holy Spirit and to what your word says. Help us to take heed. Lord, I pray that you would make us the kind of people that can bring you glory. That we would have a heart. Uh, that we would have a desire to love you and to trust you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.